Hello and welcome to Dualistic Unity Season 6, Episode 35. We, I have no idea where this is going to go, but I have just thought about exploding fruit trees and like that, it came out of nowhere. So we're going to find out in which direction this tree is going to grow. And thank you for joining along as we find out today. Amen. It is exciting to almost like surprise yourself in ways, like having some curated idea of like how your day should go or how you should be doing or what the next thing should be. It's like, there's, there's a lot of life that gets cut down. There's almost like a dulling of your experience, the less you're willing to allow yourself to surprise yourself, but there's, and it's not to say you got to let go of a lot of things, but there is a sort of rigidity, that sense of control to like keep, not just keep your environment under control, but keep yourself under control. And there, there can feel like there's like almost something in the way from doing that. But a lot of it is just your own assumptions, your own sense of comfort that like you staying in control is what's best. Cause then you feel like, you know, things a little bit more, but it's, it's, you still don't like, you still don't know what you're expressing. You still don't know what you're showing or sharing or doing. So mm -hmm. keeping yourself under control is just as much an illusion mm -hmm. as, you know, quote unquote, not being under control. It's just their idea mm -hmm. of like, kind of being tense and rigid. Like if I'm tense, I'm under control because I'm aware of myself, but like, not necessarily aware almost at all of my environment. Nice. I like where this is going because it kind of ties in with the secret topic that I wanted to explore today because it's very interesting that so much of what we're talking about is that willingness to move forward despite uncertainty, to actually mm -hmm. discount all of the assumptions of how it could go, all of the assumptions of what the benefits or, or consequences of it might be, and to actually just move forward mm -hmm. without all of that. And I find it fascinating because my daughter brought this up to me the other day. My daughter is homeschooled for anybody who's a new listener. Um, and recently she has decided there's a lot of stuff I don't know, dad. And so she has been out there learning all kinds of stuff. And what she brought up to me the other day, cause she's been um, really interested in the brain lately. Mm -hmm. She brought up, and I want to pronounce this correctly. Uh, give me a second here. The anterior mid cingulate cortex. Now, I thought this was fascinating because this is a part of our brain that is essentially in charge of processing the cost benefit of any act of will. Okay, so basically, and this is the study, uh, you can find this on the tenacious brain, how the anterior mid cingulate contributes to achieving goals. You will find it at uh, the National Library of Medicine. So what's interesting about this is that uh, basically it can help predict energy requirements that are needed for attention allocation, encoding of new information and physical movement, all in the service of goal attainment. So basically, like any other part of our body, any other part of our brain, it is something that can be built upon. Okay. But the most common response to going through something difficult is to pull back to try and maintain that sense of control, that that sense of the familiar, of the comfortable. Mm -hmm. But just like not going to the gym or going to the gym and never lifting a weight that's uncomfortable for you, you're not actually developing that brain or, or that part of the brain, which means it's harder for you to face things moving forward, to actually decide organically it's that it's worth it to do it. No. And so this yeah. study, I'm just going to read it here. Mm -hmm. uh, when faced with a difficult challenge, such as mastering complex equations or training for a marathon, many individuals will find effort too costly and withdraw. Others, however, will marshal their resources and persist in their efforts, efforts against the same challenges, even in the absence of immediate reward. This individual difference has received a great deal of attention in recent years, as growing research indicates that individuals who persevere in the face of challenging situations show better life outcomes in the domains of health, academic achievement, and career success. Mm -hmm. what they're saying is that there's a direct correlation mm -hmm. in the same way that you were able to lift more when you train your muscles you are able to lift more in a holistic kind of life sense right. when you train this particular part of your brain which means going out of your way 
to go through the discomfort. That's the only way to train this part of you is to actually go out of your way to go through something that is uncomfortable. So that way your brain can reassess that whole cost benefit allocation, making it more and more worthwhile to go, well, yeah, let's just throw it down and see what happens. Yeah. Rather than taking the safe path, which trains your brain to continue to take that safe, safe, uh, same safe path, just in the same way you would always go for the, the lighter weight mm -hmm. if you never trained your muscles. Right. Like, even just understanding that there is a component of the brain that is doing that and, and, mm -hmm. and focusing on that. And it sounds like, component is the goal in mind like it's it's very much the the goal is there and then the brain kind of works one or the other to allocate that energy towards the existing goal and mm -hmm. so like the sensitivity can almost be to like what is my underlying goal you know like do i have a, an external goal like i mentioned the marathon for example mm -hmm. like that's sort of an external goal but we can have internal goals of like safety well, too, like, even running a marathon isn't necessarily an external goal if you're doing it for a greater sense of what you can do for yourself of what you can achieve pushing past your limitations mm -hmm. doing something you've never done uh -huh. that's all more than just running a marathon it's very true it's still pushing beyond what you've done previously yeah. and doing another thing and adding to and you can kind of get on a track of like needing to do like people can almost become addicted to like marathons or ultra running and then you see someone who does a bunch of marathons and then they do ultra running and then it's like 100 miles and then it's like you know and then you get to eventually kind of like david goggins and it's just like kind of any time he's i don't know really what's in there for him but it seems like he almost it's like necessary to stay on his feet and be running and he'll just at the drop of a hat go run like 300 miles as his feet are breaking and shifting and so like that part of his brain is probably super developed and shifted and changed because he purposely just like runs through to difficult things yeah, all but in the that time specific context but right like he's exactly he pushes That's himself in the same lane he, it's all about physical goal and so like that yeah. underlying goal matters a lot too and so he's been able to direct it like in that way mm -hmm. but then it's like if he were to shift that a bit like mm -hmm. what is would it still apply to like something else? Like if his shifted goal became something totally different, like, I don't know, just like helping people in a given country. And like, instead of anything physical, yes. it was like, that was it. Like, I wonder if his brain would transfer possibly it took from there. Or if he could challenge uh, an assumption that he has about himself that, you know, that he lives in a way that's not a little bitch. Right, because he, he very much, right. you know, when I see a lot of his videos, is like, stop being a little bitch, push through. And it's like, you know, what if you could let go of that idea that you aren't a little bitch or that you or, or being OK with really? sometimes being a little bitch? And and I wonder if how how difficult that would be for him to it to be OK with feeling like a little bitch. Because a lot of what I see is anti that. Mm -hmm. It's very much he's settled on a point. He is a strong person. He perseveres. He is that is his identity. And so he does push himself a lot physically and mentally, but it's still it still feels like a bit of a crutch. And so that, you know, would be an opportunity for him to develop that that portion of his brain that doesn't need to hold on to this identity of being strong mm -hmm. in order to physically be able to push past limits. Well, that's kind of the thing. Like if there were no concept of little bitch, would he still do the things that he does? Right. 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 Yeah. And that's really the measure right there. You know, I, I, I like to live my life that way. Like if none of you fuckers were here, would I still be doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, cause it's really, mm -hmm. it's really for me, but that's, that's in itself a challenge. Mm -hmm. Right. Like to let go of even the idea of measuring yourself so that way you can live mm -hmm. for you. Right. Like for him, the concept of little bitch becomes a source of comfort. Mm -hmm. Right. He knows what to do to not be that. And that gives him an idea of what to do. But that becomes a box in itself. What's going to happen? What would happen if all of a sudden he injured himself? something out of, outside of his control. He wasn't able to do these things anymore. Yeah. What kind of mental frustration, what kind of psychological If he couldn't torture? run 25 miles think, in the morning, if yeah. he couldn't do that Oh anymore. my God. I think it's happened to him a couple of times because he's always, he's always right. kind of injured and he runs. But for how long are you going to do that? 
right? At what point does your body go, hey, I'm still organic. Yeah. You know, like I, I still have feelings, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like beat, it's like he's trying to beat it up almost. And like his his backstory specifically, you know, with being overweight and just he talks about how he was just like super lazy, had no motivation, period. And then shifted and he was like, I'm not gonna be a little bitch anymore. And he treated but laziness for obsession. Exactly. Well that was- that's the thing is underneath that, it's like is still the assumption like I am a little bitch. Yeah. And I gotta do everything in my life to prove that, that I'm, I'm not, not to right. himself. Oh, and so he's had- always yelling at himself. When I had this conversation with a client at one point where they had kind of the same backstory. They, they considered themselves to be unmotivated and all of a sudden they discovered something that lit them on fire and they just changed their life and they got super motivated. Now they're afraid not mm-hmm. to keep up that momentum because then they're going to go back to who they were. Mm-hmm. Like that person didn't already organically change into the person that they are now. Like right. you can't go yeah. back. That was just an idea. You were never actually that idea. Maybe that was a description of what you were doing, but that wasn't you. Right. But right. we feel like we're going to regress into like the fucking monster from the lagoon, you know, For like sure. I'm just going to turn back into yeah. 2005, Amanda. <laughs> 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 like reverse that shit. Do I get my hair back? All of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> yes, I certainly, the awesome. goatee certainly moves. <laughs> That's it. The goatee vanishes into my face. Hair comes back. You see yeah. the more, it just straight up goes in and then out. Yeah, out the other side. Out the, yeah. Yeah. God, oh we need that God. animated. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a point where we could. But it can feel like, like, imagine if all of a sudden we all morphed into being 15. But there can be that thought, like, as you even you know, go through or expand your comfort zone or go through like this assumption that, oh, I'm, I'm feeling like I did. The only time I remember feeling this way was, you know, in high school or in this situation. Mm -hmm. And so straight up, we can assume like, oh, I just lost, I regressed. I lost all my progress the last, you know, 15 years of my life, like just completely gone Mm -hmm. as opposed to, no, there was, there was an assumption of you like the high school you the 15 year old you like that is the you like you're a development of that person there's no way it's impossible to go back to that mm-hmm. but because then it was just presumptive ideas of how you're doing and like it still wasn't that or how you acted as if like mm-hmm. how you acted like 24 7 was this thing that you could box into like this little way it's like that's how i acted in high school i was this and that and we're cherry picking ideas and cherry picking ways that we acted and certain specific Mm -hmm. memories that maybe maybe hit but like even those specific ones we don't remember them in the way that they actually happened and then there's like an infinite number of other things that happened throughout our life that Mm -hmm. we have no memory of and a lot of times it's the ones we remember are the ones that validate the story we're telling ourselves. Yeah. And if we were to remember every side of our life, every component, remember every situation we've ever been in, every person we've ever interacted with, it would be way harder to validate some sort of story. Like in order to validate that minuscule perspective, that very specific, like, no, this is this is who I am, this is the type of person I am. We have to cherry pick, mm-hmm. like, like very much situations to the point that we can actually narrow down like trillions billions infinite number of Mm -hmm. quote-unquote moments or situations into like you know five or ten or twenty that we remember and think that those defined us somehow despite it just being like pointing at a drop in drop in the ocean essentially but it doesn't it doesn't always feel like that but again it's just to just to validate validate your personal story Right, like one drop of food coloring doesn't change the color of the ocean. Exactly. Right, that's the, that's what I was getting from your analogy. It's like, but we act as though one drop changes the entire color, mm-hmm. and it changes the entire ocean. Oh my God, yeah. it is now an ocean of despair. It's forever. Uh, I see no hope. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. We think one thought it didn't change, but it's because we're so zoomed in on that drop, on that thought that all you see, all you experience, all you are, it feels like is that drop is that emotion is that zoomed in and and that's just because that has our full attention but that doesn't mean that it has all attention 
Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing I think about attention is in the same way that as we grow and our awareness expands, our attention expands. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. You stop paying attention to such small, simplistic concepts and ideas, and you start taking in more as a result. Mm -hmm. In the same way that when you're a baby, you're really just aware of the room you're in. And then all of a sudden you're aware of the house that that room is within. Yeah. And then you become aware of the neighborhood that that house is within with the room within it. And then you become aware of the town that the right. neighborhood is within. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the state and the country yeah. and the world starts to expand right. over and over and over again. But each and every time our awareness expands and our attention has to expand with that. But instead we go, that's too much out of fear. And we grasp again for a simplistic idea of the world. Yeah. We mm -hmm. grasp for some sense of comfort. Zoom in for safety. Yeah. To not do that, to just continue to just go, okay, well, I still don't know. Mm -mm. But that's a lot of extra considerations. Like that's a lot more within the, the whole context of my life, mm -hmm. within everything that's currently part of the story. That's a lot. And I still don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, the brain, and particularly that part of the, mm -hmm. of the brain that we were talking about in terms of, of tenacity, mm -hmm. would always be in use. Because tenacity is really just being willing to face the unknown mm -hmm. relentlessly. That's what tenacity mm -hmm. is. Like, mm -hmm. where we're like, oh, it's very tenacious. No, it's just not gripping for comfort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're so used to gripping for comfort that we give it some special name. Yeah. Like, it's tenacity mm -hmm. rather than just, no, that's living. That's mm -hmm. life. That's yeah. living right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, and and that's when from there, it's, it's almost, it's not to say it's like, tenacity and madness go hand in hand but just like the con continued pursuit like it can feel like oh crazy to just keep pushing into uncertainty keep pushing past those points where it's like well i don't know what's next like we're still doing that like we're doing that all the time whether it feels familiar or unfamiliar and i think a lot of times that uncertainty like it almost gets passed from the external to the internal. Like we're trying to maintain some certainty or some familiarity to the mm -hmm. environment. It's like we're, we can't escape the attempt to escape change, mm -hmm. you know, like we'll change internally and just try and curate our environment to be under control, but like we'll mm -hmm. feel it more inside. And then it's like the more willing you are to not, you know, maintain some perspective of like how things should be or, or mm -hmm. opinions and preferences that then you can expand into your environment and kind of create an environment that you have, you know, certain opinions of and try and curate things like that. Like the less that you're doing that on the external, trying to control it, mm -hmm. it's like there is a sense of more ability to relax mm -hmm. internally. Like I think that tenacity, like it, it almost... It's like one way or the other, if it's tenacity in pushing through uncertainty, like it, it that's almost it being expelled right. from yourself versus if there isn't the tenacity, it's like, and you're trying to stay here, it's like, it all goes yeah. back into yourself. And then you feel that in mm -hmm. the sense of, you know, tension, discomfort, things like that versus just pushing through. And like, it's not to say it's going to feel great pushing through, but at least there's, it's like, there is the self-honest ability to relax because you know that you're doing it versus avoiding, mm -hmm. you know, because you really can't escape yourself. So this brings us to kind of another topic because we're talking about a part of the brain that assesses cost and benefit mm -hmm. in terms of any undertaking, right? But that, that process of, of integrating information really changes in terms of what we think about, right? Like if you weren't so obsessed with your idea of yourself, for example, the brain would be processing cost benefit in terms of like, how much does this fulfill your life? How much mm -hmm. does this have an impact on the whole? Versus how you know, much does it build up your identity? idea of yourself? Yeah. So I found this to be fascinating because there was this study that was done in the early 2000s on a group of capuchin monkeys. Mm -hmm. And what they did through a long period of training, it took a long time for them to train this group to understand money, the concept 
of money, of value, the concept yeah. of value, more importantly external than anything, value. external value. And so over the year, they taught them the, that money had value and they introduced different fruits, different types of food and jello cups, which were the priciest of the food. Okay. And what the monkeys learned to do was act responsibly at first in terms of, oh, well, okay, it costs that much. I got to reserve my money. You know, or oh shit, the, the jello just went down in price. I should go and buy a bunch of jello. Mm -hmm. So they made choices like that. Really? Absolutely. Oh, okay. But then what went with that was suddenly the fear of losing their money and the desire to hoard more money. So all of a sudden the monkeys themselves started to trade money for things that they wanted for other other people's food, for example, or they would try to steal money from the other monkeys, mm -hmm. right? They would start to gamble with their money, right? But all of a sudden there became a fear of losing something that ultimately had no real value. Mm -hmm. The monkeys could have just continued existing without this concept mm -hmm. entirely, and it would have changed everything. But all of a sudden now they're going through that cost benefit analysis, right? With this concept of money. And it mm -hmm. got to the point where the monkeys themselves were like trading money for prostitution yeah. and they were gambling. And basically mm -hmm. all of these things just got introduced with the concept of value. Mm -hmm. of value itself so it makes you wonder what would be our process of cost benefit analysis if we mm -hmm. weren't so obsessed with the idea of our own value being something that can be increased or diminished yeah like where that focus goes in the world definitely is reflected where it goes in ourself and like mm -hmm. the being willing to look at the reality of your experience versus the protection of some idea that's so personal like that protective yeah. thing when that attention goes towards your personal idea of yourself and like that whole cost benefit analysis like mm -hmm. that's a lot of brain power being used and targeted in a very like futile direction Correct. like an entirely futile direction self-defined so yeah no less so you can be at it all day and still kick yourself down oh yeah oh for sure like I've, I've had situations where it's like, I can go through something feeling fine about it pretty much the whole time. And then it ends and I'll like beat myself. The other night I was having a conversation with someone at the bar, went great for the most part towards the end, thought I said something dumb and then woke up the next morning, totally forgot the conversation, but remembered the last dumb thing I said on the yeah. way out that could have just like been completely unnoticed. But mm -hmm. I was wondering with the, you know, discussion of the brain and like, the capacity of our brain, like how much say like with the hypothetical for anyone who hasn't seen the movie Lucy, highly recommend that thing. But there's the thing that where it's like, oh, we only use 10% of our brain, like for this specific, like how much is that, you know, cost benefit analysis and the power of that being just dumped? Is sure. that like another 5% that because we're focusing on our idea of ourselves, trying to control that, that like, it's futile and personal and like everyone else has a different idea. So it's like kind of absurd, like very absurd is yeah, an understatement, but like how much is that cutting down on our mental capacity, our ability to like process reality? Even? I would even use the term uh, conscious bandwidth because yeah. it really is that mm -hmm. like when you think of bandwidth and just how much information can come in at one mm -hmm. time, like this part of our brain really is access to opening that up mm -hmm. and if we're not willing to it remains very small we actually have to train it in order to mm -hmm. take in more information that it's blocking out out of discomfort but what's interesting about that is again there's more information there suddenly mm -hmm. we're in that that process of uncertainty all the time that's why i think it's funny because we use the expression going through uncertainty but it's not really going through there's no end to it mm -hmm. right like there, there's no other side of uncertainty yeah <laughs> more yeah. it's also like you're in uncertain like you're in uncertainty now it's not yeah. even like you're moving to it or through it you're maintaining stuff to convince yourself that you're yeah. not uncertain right now too so the brain or that part of the brain which is again or rather they theorize is allocating energy mm. according to how tenacious you're willing to be yeah what is the limitation there like 
Mm -hmm. because we don't necessarily understand what it is we're clinging to. We like all of a sudden we're understanding this. Like, yeah, if we train this part of our brain, we're going to be more tenacious. And they said it in health and academic achievement and, and career, career success. Yeah. And it's like, but those are all things that we take comfort in. Like all of those identities are another wall to developing that part of the brain. If you think about it, they're mm -hmm. yet another place that you're like, Nope, that's, that's good. It's like, what, what exists outside of defining yourself with those things? What kind of life exists outside of clinging to some concept or structure or path, mm -hmm. right? And so that, like, even that, like, we recognize it, but then we're like, immediately, that fits into the known. I immediately fit that into the known. And we're just like, hold on, stop, look at what you're saying there. But we have to look at it through, again, that immediate tendency towards bias that the monkeys were showing as soon as there was the idea of value. As soon as there's the idea of value, we don't want to push certain walls. We need to protect that value. And that value is, at the moment, invested in our idea of ourself. Mm -hmm. So as much as we're like, yes, this part of the brain is the key to unlocking our potential, mm -hmm. but within this framework. Mm -hmm. Don't go outside that framework. And nobody sees the bias because their value is determined by that framework. They're not willing to give it up. Mm -hmm. The idea of themselves is as much as the as much unnecessary as the money was to the monkeys. Mm -hmm. But we've convinced ourselves it's now necessary. It's part of our environment, and therefore we have to use it. We can't just move beyond it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what the what exists beyond that? You know, like because even with the you know getting a good job, living a good life, buying this thing, like whatever, it's like we'll use that part of the brain to get mm -hmm. to those things. But then it's like, it's got that sort of cap, right? Like it, it's, it's this, mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't know, like a dome, like a perspective, like all the things that like make you successful, accomplished, whatever are like those self-defining things. And that's kind of, that's kind of the extent, like how well can I define myself? Like how many things can I achieve or accomplish that mean something about me in the best way? And it's like, you know, the, the tree we were referring to in another recent episode, like that's mm -hmm. all focused on, you know, yourself and feeling good about yourself and how you fit in to the world as opposed to like being the world and like what that mm -hmm. opens up. Like when you push past or it's not at all about you, like being a certain way or achieving certain things personally. And it's just like, you kind of become a, tool for yourself to have experience but not make it so much about you because it is very reflective like you know you're making it about you you're making it about like how you're doing it's like that's what you feel you feel the tension from like that focus it's very much like reflected you know our experience and our our push our focus as opposed to if it's not about me so much if it's not about how i'm doing then there's a lot more space to like things open up and it's like, well, I can, I can choose to do this because it's an option. And if it doesn't mean so much about me, then all of a sudden that side of the brain with the cost benefit analysis, like that starts working in a different direction for the whole, for the whole. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's another. And so there's actually a part of our brain where like, what do I do if I'm not guided by how I'm doing and my sense of self and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you kind of have to let that go to find out because the brain, there is a side of the brain, like, you know, we've been talking about that will adapt to a new goal, a new focus. But it's like, that's maybe some of our influence is like, mm -hmm. you know, putting that in a, in a direction. Yeah. Well, the brain you know, is, power. is going to get better at what it keeps doing. You know, it's like any tool it's shaped by the tasks it's, it will be doing, you know? And, and so, um, it makes sense that the brain is is just going in the direction where it's pointed to, mm -hmm. and that money, like like our identity, is just a tool that we can use, and it's just supposed to represent the value that's already there. But we seem to think that the money is the value, and it's not. The money is just a tool of trade in the way that we used to trade our skills, and that was a way that we traded the value that we were that we are. And now when we think of money, it's like that, that is where all the value is. That's, that needs to be the priority. And so that's why I need to hoard it because it, it's filling, it's filling the lack that I'm, that I'm feeling and creating. 
but the but the money is just it's it's not an issue. It, it's just the way that we attach to it, the way that we think about it, that that creates it. And so when I hear people saying money is the root of all evil, it's like, no, it's not. It's it's just a tool of trade. And and the way that we use it impacts the way that we experience it. But we could change the way that we use it. We could get rid of it. It's like we draw we drew a line in the sand thinking that that there needs to be a line in the sand, forgetting that there never used to be a line. And so as much as you could move the line, as much as you could overcome the line, as much as you could go around the line, you could just also not draw the line. Or when you do draw the line, remember that it's optional. Yeah. Yeah. The line is absolutely optional. It's not something that you have to necessarily you know, follow even. But yeah, it's like those shifts, the those ideas, that sense of control, that sense of certainty, that sense of security. It's like... Mm -hmm. We're, we're so focused on certain sides of that that we don't even realize how much that's getting in the way of our experience. And I just wanted to say how appreciative I am for people from all, all over, over the world right. tuning in yes. to this episode. Hello. We got uh, Kelly. Hello from Denmark. London, Felix, Africa. Africa. Oh my goodness. This is great. Hello, everyone. I know Levi's mm -hmm. from Norway and a number of people are from the United States and otherwise. Thank you all for being here and uh, giving us a shout out in the comments. It's nice to know you're here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> and joining us as we talk about the brain and how easy it is to forget that it's just a passenger in the car and it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be the driver. And the car being your life, your experience, your moment to moment. And, you know, it's, it is, it is, a, it is a muscle. It is a tool. It's the way that we can, we can shape it by what we prioritize. I like that. I, I like the fact that it, it adapts to us. We tend to think our brain is limited and that we are limited by it. We were having a conversation yesterday. Actually, you were having a conversation with somebody at the bar and they were talking about uh, weed. Just like, no, I, I can't, I can't smoke weed i have anxiety and you're mm -hmm. like well you know that's something that you can always face and they're like nope i have anxiety yeah, I've, been I'm, I've been medicated because i have anxiety yeah that's beyond me that's mm -hmm. my brain my brain just creates anxiety that's it's it's so very different and rare because it just just pumps out this anxiety shit in it's like fucking, don't say. it yeah. is crazy how much <laughs> my <laughs> brain specifically pumps out more just anxiety exactly. than yeah. anyone it's else just, and, and it's just like okay, but your brain is adapting to what you're investing in. Yeah. So if you're investing in the habit of always bowing down to that anxiety, you're going to continue to bow down to that anxiety. It's yeah. going to get harder and harder and harder. In the same way, it becomes more and more difficult to open a lid on a jar if you never do it yourself. Yeah. Right? If you never do it yourself, you're always like, can you open this? And you open this and you don't take the time to fucking struggle fight the fucking thing. Ah! But it gets grab your t-shirt wrap it around you know tap it with a goddamn knife do it just and i want to say if you're doing this a quick tip would be to take a very small spoon put it under the lid of the jar and then pry it open until you hear that the air go and then it opens no problem but it's got to be a very small thing you could tap on it which is really just trying to, to bend the metal lid so there's a little bit of air released when you tap on it with a knife okay. or you can just open it with a very small teaspoon but you know yeah. that that trick was found after a thousand attempts correct that it wasn't someone you know, i feel bad even sharing it because i was just saying do it the hard way do it the hard way because yeah, you will gain strength from it and then you will appreciate the spoon mm -hmm. thing later mm -hmm. right yes. in fact do it the hard way until you're like fuck i can't do it and then go find a spoon absolutely because at least then you got some some of the resistance because there's something to isolated uh strength training as well you know <laughs> even if it's on a lid from time to time but e even like you know yeah you build strength as you're opening it but that difference between like oh i can't open this and then oh i can like it kind of opens up that even as a potential like if you've tried 100 times and never open mm -hmm. the lid before like and then you do it and then the next time around, like it could be way tougher to open it, but you're going to be able to like, just because you know, it can even happen. Like we see this in the world all the time. I have no idea what we would get restricted. TikTok, TikTok doesn't for. like the talking about authenticity, being yourself, <laughs> you know, and, all. And, and again, I think, I think it's really important that we recognize 
that this is very much the, the basis of this conversation. This is why I brought this up is because we can recognize very easily like, right, right. You know, facing the hardship, that, that's good for me. You know, we can recognize that cerebrally and then we can get in there and go, yeah. So what hard shit do I need to face? Not realizing that that's actually the easy way hmm. to actually project a hard way is sticking to the known. to walk forward into uncertainty is to recognize you don't know what the hard way is. That's the hard way yeah. is to go forward without it. Like immediately you want to superimpose something that you're biased about. You're biased which means that you can't project into the future what you need mm -hmm. you can't project the next step in becoming enlightened because that's enlightenment is to just be here mm -hmm. right that's it it's to recognize there's nowhere to go there's no enlightenment right yeah. that's mm -hmm. the bitch i like the way that you said it before it was like not enlightenment but a lightening exactly you know, like the weight of your thoughts the weight of your assumptions lifts and so it's not like you're without weight. It's that it doesn't feel so unbearably heavy anymore. Because it goes, and that goes with uncertainty, like the lightening of your own experience goes with uncertainty, but mm -hmm. you don't get the false certainty. You don't get that sense of control so much, but that's where the weight comes mm -hmm. from is like the investment in the false certainty, in that sense of control. And so to think like, oh, I want to feel lighter and I want to know what's next. And I want to know how it's going to go. And I want to know what it means about me. And I want to know what the hard thing is. Like, you don't get both. You don't get to have both. But, you know, if you're convinced that control can work, that like, no, I, I know what I want. And once I get there, that'll be the case. Like, you can kind of, I don't know. It's not to say that you can create a lighter experience, but like, it's never really gonna be that and i was thinking about you know like doing the hard stuff and like going back to david goggins it's like for him is he's convinced like the hard stuff is going on long runs it's all physical things mental whatever he probably does all sorts of really really hard things but there is a degree of of knowledge behind that like all the hard stuff you know we're convinced like oh i run a marathon oh i do like and i've seen examples of this in my own life too like i went to uh open mic comedy night one night and I was like it's not to say that that wasn't a tough thing that was like something to quote unquote mm -hmm. overcome or whatever just getting up there and doing it but at the same time it was like I was in during that period that month whatever like I was looking for hard things to do because like I wanted to remain like have a sense of control instead of like deep down, I know, you know, certain things mm -hmm. that jumping in uncertainty, facing the unknown, like that was really the thing I was avoiding looking at as I was trying to know tough things to do. And so, yeah, because facing the uncertainty and even even for the hard stuff, like that sounds way less comfortable, way tougher. But again it's like living in this spot where it's like no I, I can find out there's all these things out there that are the hard things to do they're curated hard things ice bath you know long runs whatever all that mm -hmm. all that stuff. facing your fears even even that even that even facing your fears because those fears are kind of mm -hmm. assumptions like i know i'm afraid of this because what you get uncomfortable when you think about it you don't and like maybe you've avoided it in mm -hmm. your life but really even those it's like as they come up, but you don't have to pursue them because you could come up with a million fears in a moment. It's like you're really going to spend your whole life facing every single one and think that that's what your life is about. Oh, I just got to face all my fears. It's like, OK, and then what? As opposed to living and as you face certain mm -hmm. things that maybe are less comfortable or you're a little bit less certain, like even, you know, jumping into something that's very, it seems very basic and you just go in without so much preparation. It's mm -hmm. like that can feel less comfortable, but there's strength in yourself that's built there. There's faith in yourself that's built there when it isn't, you know, the prepped thing or the, the thing like, oh, I know once I do this, once I overcome this, then I'll feel better. I'll feel more okay with myself instead of like, oh, I can feel okay with myself right now. 
and do things. And I'm mid sneeze, and I think it's gonna go away. You're dealing with it very well. Feel You're great. dealing with it. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of went right back into my head, and now it's just kind of floating, <laughs> circulating yeah. inside your sinuses. So right, if I sound right. kind of funny the rest of the episode, <laughs> oh, good it actually feels good times. Feel, so feel free if you'd like to go and punk your schnoz. I don't know if there's anything I can do right now. It's, kind of, it's just kind of burrowed. But you see, that's it. See, you're developing that part of the brain. You're, you're, you're like, yeah, I just got to go through this right now. That's pretty much it. And yeah. I might as well express what it's like to do so. Right. And the sneeze will come out. It's not like you decided, I'm going to sneeze now. Yeah. And then sneeze. It's like, that was, that was something that was potentially happening. And then it didn't happen. And uh, it's so funny how often we'll describe things like, oh, this is so hard. This is so difficult. And it's like, is it though? You know, uh, you know, I, when I think about possibly starting an episode and doing the intro, I was like, oh, that might be hard. And I was thinking that like beforehand, like a, like a week ago. And then I was like, oh, but I don't, I don't introduce these episodes. I don't introduce classes. So I came in here all like, I'm certain. I know what's going to happen. I'm just going to sit here and relax. Then you guys were like, you want an intro? I was like, shit. <laughs> I thought I knew. Oh my god! And, you, and oh I was, god. and I was almost thinking that that's how I was gonna start it. Like I was gonna relax, but this guy over here just <laughs> drops an introduction in my lap, and here I am introducing today's episode. Welcome to season six, episode thirty-five. You know, so I thought about that. I was like, you know what? Scrap that. Exploding trees, it is. You know, <laughs> you know? exploding fruit trees. Exploding fruit yeah. trees, yeah. exactly. Yeah, seeds thanks, that fly. Thanks, guys. thanks, guys. Hundreds I, of miles per hour. Oh my goodness! Imagine though, the first person who encountered that. You know, you just go for a walk in the park, a walk in the, just just going for a stroll in my afternoon. All of a sudden, a tree is attacking me, shooting its <laughs> seeds, and it's just the trees. Like I'm just trying to live, man. See, now that's funny because my brain actually just went straight to a fruit tree as a whole. Because what is an explosion, right? It, right. It's just this huge outward projection mm -hmm. right that's what a tree is it's just really slowed down right <laughs> slow like, really slow motion really explosion. Slowed down. and then not just explosions but then like tiny explosions every year as the fruit goes yeah yeah, yeah. and it just it appears and then it drops and it appears and then it drops and then yeah. it appears and it drops and then finally the whole fucking tree goes away right. boom explosion see it's, so to me i was just like that's a really cool way of looking at it right you know, if you're yeah, if you were to watch a tree grow, like, in super speed, it would right. look like a mushroom cloud. Yeah. Like, and it would do, yeah. And, it would do, yeah. 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 and for anybody who's listening to this after the fact, what I just did was an exploding upward motion followed by a falling over motion, followed by an exploding upward motion, followed by a falling over motion. Because yes. on yes. A, a fast enough timeline, that's exactly what it would look like. You know, yeah. And that's one of the things I, I love about time as a whole. Like it comes down to scale, yeah. right? But even even a tree, you know, it doesn't have that part of the brain that we're talking about. But it is doing exactly that consciously all the time. It's pushing forward. It's facing gravity consistently. We that. have to lie down. We have to actually take a break. Gravity beats us every fucking day. Mm -hmm. Whereas a tree never relents it never gives years. up it just yeah. keeps going so what i find fascinating about this conversation about the anterior mid cortex nice. is the fact that we're saying that it operates in terms of energy allocation based on a cost benefit analysis in mm -hmm. terms of what's the benefit of me pushing myself like this? is this worth it right mm -hmm. so it's very much the governor Mm -hmm. on our conscious bandwidth mm -hmm. on how much awareness we're willing to take in and work with all the time in that state of uncertainty mm -hmm. moving forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well what would be possible if one were to consciously just surrender the idea of cost benefit to actually move beyond the idea because ultimately what we're doing is we're telling our brain there's a benefit to letting go of cost i benefit. assume uh -huh. that one will be that uh, right there's a benefit to letting go of cost benefit right but there's also a cost to letting go of cost benefit yeah, but what is so this cost? that's the point they they don't really exist yeah. the cost is the way that you think right the cost is the known uh -huh. right the benefit is the unknown but that's not a benefit because that's that's it just is. what it is yeah. right so we're literally hacking a part of our brain by simply changing the mentality that we operate on how much does that right. affect our evolution as a species considering so much of our brain up until this point has been dictated and influenced by 
buy cost benefit as a thing buy this fictional value that's so fucked up a group of monkeys where for human beings or thousands of years our brain has adapted accordingly wow. what are we doing for ourselves in the amount of bandwidth or attention or awareness by simply abandoning the idea of cost benefit of abandoning the idea of value of actually simply being here with as much attention as possible with full bandwidth available yeah, but that's all driven by fear. You know, the 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 cost benefit is driven by the fear that you will you will miss out, you won't get enough, that you won't be enough, that there's a value to attain. It's the 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 value system, the cost benefit system is still driven by fear. And we could see that in our day to day that a lot of our choices are driven by that fear that either this is too much or I can't handle it. I won't do it well enough, but that's all just fear that, you know, it's not worth it to be authentic. It's not worth it to show up. It's not right. worth it to pay attention. All of that is because I'm scared that I couldn't pay attention, that I couldn't show up when every single moment I am, I, I am yeah. period. Yeah. We don't even have to continue. It's like this, everything is just existing. And it's like, of course we, we don't need the cost benefit um, template, but, we made it and then used it over and over and then forgot why we met, why we created it to begin with because we've been using it on auto, autopilot. But so I think that, you know, when we're talking about like like bandwidth and like using 10%, it's like, when the fuck do you use 10% of your brain? Because last time I checked, you're using the whole thing the whole time. Yeah, but you're using not. the You're using all the parts of it, you know, it's just that we, we want to measure it. Like, oh, well, we didn't use it like Einstein. Oh, we didn't use it like this person. And it's like um, the whole brain, your whole body, every cell existence is always working. Existence is always moving and grooving, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but the conscious bandwidth, I think, is a better or it's um, it's another way that we could describe just the experience of attention being ex expressed is that it's not that you need to use more of your brain is that you could that there is more attention available and you could access it if you would stop zooming in into the how and just look you know be the what exactly and i think there's some evidence for that like in terms of the brain actually adapting according to how much attention you are willing to spend and how much you are willing to plunge through the unknown mm -hmm. for example einstein's brain glad you brought up einstein mm -hmm. einstein's brain has been studied I think it was also stolen. It was stolen because he did not <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. But uh, <laughs> it, it's been studied. And what they found Look was that he had an especially thick layer of kind of connective tissue on the it outside was a lot thicker, they of said. his brain. And they're like, well, that's, that's why he was Einstein. And I would say that he was, was Einstein wrong. and that's what made the, the brain, brain shit happen was because over time, just through not putting a governor on that bandwidth mm -hmm. to the same degree, which is why he was so keen on visualization, on imagination, on yeah. looking to other worldly things that people wouldn't even want to look at. Like, I wonder what light looks like when it travels. It's like, holy fuck, that's a great question. And you start immediately your brain's churning on shit that everybody else gets uncomfortable about. Yeah. Well, what are we doing all the time in this conversation? Every time we're like, you know, oh yeah, this really sucks. But does it really suck? What does suck mean? Yeah. What do I mean by it sucks for me? <laughs> What, who is me? And then all of a sudden you're going through all of this, <laughs> this, this the discomfort. And, and you're dissecting and everything. You're like, oh, yeah. another layer. Ooh, what's under? Is there? Is there under something underneath that? That sounds so simple, yeah. right? But all of that is part of the process of eventually letting it go. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what it is: is that we're still dealing with remnants of just wanting to hold on to the end, holding on to the edges. You know, not letting that bandwidth just be fully untapped, mm -hmm. not not letting ourselves be in the flow as it's flowing all the time as the flow, mm -hmm. because we keep going back to this idea of ourselves, and that idea can't possibly face that. There are things on the line, mm -hmm. right? There's value. There's certainty, there's security, there's I could safety. risk losing myself. Immediately, there's this idea, there's a self that can be lost. And you're like, how can you do that? Without even realizing it, that part of your brain has went, oh, hold up production, slow that shit down. You know, that's not worth it. There's a cost, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't see a benefit. And there isn't a benefit to the ego. There is no benefit to the idea of yourself. There is zero benefit of letting go. <laughs> but to the reality of you, you know the benefit. You feel the benefit. That's why you're having this conversation. That's why you take that time to go for a walk. That's why those value, those moments of silence have so much value. Mm -hmm. It's because the real you, the one that's experiencing this right now, mm -hmm. 
you know what the benefit of letting go is. But the idea of you is going to fight and struggle every step of the way because it is holding on. The idea of you and holding on go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so it really, like anyone who, like an Einstein or a person like that, that shift where it's, it's not the, because we're so fixated on like learning more, gaining more knowledge, improving ourself. But like mm -hmm. maybe someone like Einstein, and as we've discussed in this episode, just let more of that happen it's just not getting in your way so yeah. much it's like the potential is all there like the potential yeah. is all in you you know your highest self is like you as you are like it's it's very much and einstein just didn't put so many blocks in his way so many assumptions so many ways that like There's a quote that backs that up yeah a problem can't be solved from the same state of mind oh that right? created that it. created it yeah like that, that indicates in right off the bat he knew the value of letting go yeah. of his state of mind he knew the value of questioning what he thought to be real yeah and i like where he said also where he um people think that i'm smarter but i just take longer to answer a question he sits he, he in his opinion he would sit with questions for a lot longer just chewing and and that was in his opinion why he would find why he would find or um, lead, you know, to answers that were so different and so unique. It's just because he would sit with a question for longer. He would he would just be spaced for it instead of rushing to settle on a point where you think you know the majority of a topic or all, you know. And so I, I liked that that he was like, it's not that I'm I'm not smarter. I just sit with questions longer. That's it. That's it. Doesn't <laughs> panic. Doesn't panic about mm -hmm. it. And like he, it sounds like he just kind of never panicked in response and just let it be. Didn't assume like. Oh, I gotta gotta get back to this person, gotta do this for them. He's just like, I'm gonna, yeah, take this in, take my time, let it kind of percolate, like knowing that there's something there. Like I'm curious how aware of you know letting go, not facing, like not putting things in his own way he was, or if it was just that? Exactly. what do you mean? When? Exactly. Which him are you yeah. talking about? At which right. moment? I need to be more specific in your questioning, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's, that's exactly right. it. How yeah. how aware can you be? Yeah. You are awareness. Yeah. That's not even a measurement that exists outside of that concept in your mind. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, we had a conversation with somebody the other night who was having kind of a hard day, and I'm like, you feel kind of heavy, man. And he's like, what? I'm supposed to be at a hundred percent all the time. It's like you are at a hundred percent right now. It's right. Just, you're just hundred percent paying attention to something that's weighing you down. Like that, that's, that's all <laughs> yeah. like, that, that, like it, you're, that you are awareness. You can't not be awareness. It's just, what are you paying attention to? Yes. Where is your awareness going? Because that's very much what's again, right. are you indicating here or how much of that bandwidth you're accessing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, in discover transcendence where I talk about the more light bulbs you hook up to a battery, the dimmer every bulb gets. Mm -hmm. That is from discovery. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's exactly that. Yeah. Whereas if you surrender yeah. a bunch of these things that you're invested in, that you're holding on to as concepts, as mm -hmm. a measure of your value, as certainty, then all of a sudden what you find is you have so much more in terms of attention here and now. And there's no way for you to measure that. That's the bitch about it. But you can watch it over time as it impacts your life. Mm -hmm. Day by day, moment by moment, mm -hmm. year by year, all of a sudden what you recognize is that your life has dramatically changed by virtue of you just putting more of your attention into it as it's happening. Mm -hmm. That's not a measurable change. You can't be like, and this on this day, this changed in my I'm life. And everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but the point is, is that over time, your understanding of awareness, your understanding of yourself, your understanding of, of the concepts that you hold on to grows, it changes. And that part of your brain continues to adapt. Mm -hmm. right? And that's why I love dualistic unity. I love these conversations because all of these conversations, if somebody was to go into this, go, how am I supposed to apply this to my life though? Damn it. Right. They wouldn't get anything out of this, but to face that, to go, well, they're not actually telling me anything. I have to process this myself. I have to look at where my discomfort lies and I have to look at where I would prefer to think my discomfort lies because mm -hmm. that's the trick. You know, I need to look at what I I'm like, no, I need to deal with this. Immediately be suspicious of that. Mm -hmm. Immediately, if your brain's like, this is the solution to our problem. Don't trust that motherfucker. Because the hard part 
is to not trust that motherfucker. And that's what you haven't trained yourself to do. That's the point is to let yourself be here and let what happens happen Mm -hmm. as you. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's that act of faith. This has been a fun episode. Everyone, this has been a blast. I want to make a quick announcement before we wrap up today. Uh, The Port Alberni tickets, they are not publicly available as yet. And it's because we decided to give our Patreon supporters a couple more weeks. Uh, The reason being a few of them reached out and said, hey, I don't quite have uh, my plans together yet. I'm still waiting for work uh, to let me know if I can get the time off, that kind of thing. So we're going to hold off for, I don't know, longer. let's just uh, say until, week. yeah, yeah. After, yeah. after the 15th weeks. Yeah. Weeks. let's just say maybe the, the weekend of the 20th, let's okay. say the Sunday, the 20th, I think Sunday's the 20th, no, that's Saturday, Sunday, the 21st, 20-ish. yeah, exactly. Somewhere in July, we will let you, uh, <laughs> we will let those tickets be publicly available. If you don't know about our Port Alberni retreat, it's dope. It's going to be amazing. You can check out the details on Patreon at the moment or listen to previous episodes where I droned on and on about how awesome it is. Um, but for now, I think we're going to wrap up. So that's it for me. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, for everybody, shout out to my daughter, who, of course, introduced the mm-hmm. concept uh, of this part yeah. of the brain to me and the importance of willpower. Uh, and shout out to everybody who is doing this in your everyday life, because mm-hmm. you may not see the impact. I may not see the impact, but it's known. It's known that you're making one and it is appreciated. Very much so. It's it's there. It's playing out. And, you know, we are each other's environment. And so when it's, you know, that ability to measure cost benefit isn't so fixated on on yourself that just keeps fucking dumping things into the void that sort of investment in control it uh who knows how the world's going to shift and change but you know it starts with us and i also don't even know what the world is right now beyond my assumption of what i conveniently like to think that it is which is far too simple but yeah this has been a lot of fun I'm, i've been enjoying doing the uh sub one hour episodes i know we discussed possibly in season seven keeping things like a little bit more more uh i don't know shorter but um yeah so i'm gonna stop now but and jay mary kate marie appreciate you guys in the comments and everyone else who is in here from all over the world it was great to see felix i noticed uh some of your comments in there and we have lots of other episodes throughout the week where we're checking in on questions and do our call-in show and do our q a sessions so lots of opportunities to get uh get more questions in there as well but it's been great amanda yeah well <laughs> thanks everybody it's been a blast and uh appreciate you all joining and um look forward to keeping this conversation going and all the explorations outside of the chats take care everyone See you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Oh, one more thing, actually, before we sign Same. off. Uh, <laughs> we will be joined this Monday by Levi. Uh, so check out that episode, which should be recorded 4 p.m. Eastern time this coming Monday. We're going to have Levi on for an episode. We're going to cover some dope shit. That's Woo! it now. I promise. Take care.